Today's reading is from 1 Peter 5, verses 12 to 14. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Well, hello, Avenue, and welcome to this last in our sermon series in the New Testament letter of 1 Peter. Now, even though Peter himself describes this letter as a brief one, we've deliberately moved quite slowly over the last few months in it. We wanted to take some time to really listen to what God has to say to us through 1 Peter, because we felt the message of this letter is just such a timely one with its themes of suffering and struggle in the Christian life. It's themes of understanding our identity and our mission as the people of God. Or it's themes of following in the steps of Jesus as we trust in him in this world. But as we prepare to leave the letter of 1 Peter today, I want us to think together, what have we learnt from this letter, both as individuals and as a church family? And how will that help us love God more and love our neighbour more? What are some of the key messages we want to take away with us from our time in 1 Peter? Well, to help us answer those questions, I'm going to try and summarise some of the key themes of 1 Peter for us today. Because we don't just want to rush away from 1 Peter and go to the next bit of the Bible. It's right to pause sometimes, to really allow the message of 1 Peter to sink into our lives and change us. So this is going to be a bit of an overview of 1 Peter today. So do you have your Bibles open in 1 Peter? We're going to range around a bit in the letter. But before we do that, we want to look briefly at the closing couple of verses that have just been read to us. 1 Peter 5, verses 12 to 14. Now, how does Peter choose to finish this letter? Well, hope you can see Peter finishes with a series of final greetings to the Christians he's writing to. And to be honest, this is one of those passages we tend to skip over in the New Testament. It's got lots of names of people we don't know personally. As a result, it's sort of hard to see the relevance of these verses for us today. And we're not going to spend a lot of time in these verses, but I believe that even these final greetings have something to teach us, I think. See, by closing his letter in this way, the Apostle Peter is gently reminding us that even though he was an apostle of Jesus Christ and a leader of the early church, Peter didn't live the Christian life on his own. Peter needed other Christians around him to help him, to pray for him, to love him, to spur him on to love and good deeds. And in that, well, Peter's just like every Christian watching this today. So who does Peter mention here? Well, verse 12, first of all, he mentions a man called Silas. This is probably the same man who's mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. He accompanied the Apostle Paul on his travels in Asia Minor and Greece, recorded for us in the book of Acts. And Silas may have helped Peter write this letter, just as he's named as a co-author of 1 and 2 Thessalonians with Paul and Timothy. Or Silas may have just been the person sent by Peter to deliver this letter to the churches scattered across Asia Minor. But either way, Peter regarded him as a faithful brother, verse 12, and he encourages the Christians he's writing to, to regard him in the same way. Then verse 13, Peter mentions she who is in Babylon, verse 13. Now, this is a little harder to identify, but almost certainly this is a reference to the church in Rome, rather than just to an unnamed individual woman. You see, for early Christians in the early church, Babylon was often a code word for Rome. And Peter may well have been living in Rome and a member of the church in that great city as he was writing this letter. And finally, in verse 13, Peter refers to my son, Mark, which is almost certainly a reference to John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas who traveled with Paul and Barnabas for a short time and the author of the second gospel account of Jesus' life we have in the New Testament. 
Early church tradition describes Mark as Peter's helper and disciple in Peter's old age. And Peter's widely regarded as one of Mark's key eyewitnesses when he was writing his gospel. Mark wasn't literally the son of Peter, but Peter clearly regards him with love and affection here. See, even from these final greetings, we learn something important. Peter was a Christian who lived in close relationship with other believers. Peter belonged to a local church. Peter needed other Christians around him to spur him on in the faith. And in that, Peter is no different than the rest of us. See, if you're a Christian watching this today, you need to belong to a local church. You need other Christians around you to encourage and spur you on. The Christian life is never meant to be lived on our own. We need other Christians around us. And alongside these personal greetings here, we get Peter's own description of his letter in verse 12. And he describes his letter there as having two main purposes. He's writing to encourage his Christian readers and he's writing to testify to the truth of the gospel. And Peter's great desire for his readers is summed up for us in verse 12, where he writes, This is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. This is the true grace of God. Everything I've been writing to you, the way of life I've described for you in this letter is the true grace of God, says Peter. So stand fast in it. Don't move away from this way of life. Don't move away from the grace of God. Don't give up following Jesus in this world. See, Peter knew that we are tempted to give up sometimes. Peter knew that Christian life is not always easy, but he says the gospel of Jesus Christ really is the true grace of God. We won't find the truth of who God is anywhere else, and we won't find the grace of God towards us in Christ anywhere else. So Peter urges us all, stand fast in this grace. Don't move away from it and help each other stand fast in God's grace too. So as we prepare to leave this letter today then, what are some of the key words of encouragement and instruction that we can take away with us from the letter of 1 Peter? Well, I'm going to summarise them for us under three main headings and range around a bit. The headings are this. Peter says, don't be surprised by suffering and struggle in the Christian life. Then secondly, he urges us, always remember who you are in Christ And thirdly, he says, rejoice that God is making you more like Jesus. So let's look at the first of these now. Don't be surprised by suffering and struggle in the Christian life. Just look at 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Peter writes this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Now, in part, it's been the fact that Peter's writing to Christians who are suffering and struggling in their lives that has connected so strongly with us as a church family over recent months. Now, of course, Peter's readers weren't going through a global pandemic as we are today. But a large part of the message of 1 Peter is this. Suffering and struggle in the Christian life is a vital part of the calling to follow Christ. In the Christian life, suffering and struggle are part of the deal and we should always be ready for them, says Peter. Now, as we've been reading 1 Peter together, it's been clear that what Peter's readers were experiencing, it wasn't the full-scale state-sponsored persecution we often think about when we think of the early church. So Peter's readers weren't being fed to lions or set on fire by Roman soldiers. That would come just a few years later under the persecution of Nero and later Roman emperors. Instead, on the whole, Peter's readers and the persecution they were facing was really that of being mocked and insulted for following Jesus. Look at chapter 2 and verse 12. These Christians were being accused of doing wrong by the people around them. Or chapter 3 and verse 16. There were people who spoke maliciously against them and what they believed. Or chapter 4 and verse 4, people heaped abuse on them for living differently. 
You see, in many ways, the rejection and scorn Peter's readers experienced for following Jesus in the first century just isn't a million miles away from the rejection and scorn Christians experience today for following Jesus in our culture. Whether that's on social media, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's from some friends or neighbours or family members even. And Peter doesn't dance around the realities of rejection and scorn. Experiencing hostility for following Jesus is painful. Peter knew all about that. It hurts, especially when it's from people who we live alongside, work alongside and care about. But what Peter does help us see in this letter is that we shouldn't be surprised when times of rejection, suffering and struggle come into our lives as Christians. They're not evidence that somehow we're doing something wrong as Christians. Often, actually, they're evidence that we really are seeking to follow Jesus and live for him in the places he's put us. So according to 1 Peter, why do Christians suffer in this world? Well, Peter gives us a number of reasons. First of all, we suffer because of the hostility and incomprehension of the world. That's chapter 4 and verse 4. Peter writes, They're surprised that you don't join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. We suffer because we're different, says Peter. A second reason is that we have an ongoing battle with sin and unbelief in our own hearts. That's chapter 2. Verse 11, dear friends, Peter writes, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. And the third reason we suffer is that we have a powerful enemy who is out to get us. We saw that last week, chapter 5 and verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind, says Peter. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And over the centuries, Christians have come up with a shorthand for these three main battlegrounds. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Peter tells us here, don't be surprised by suffering and struggle in the Christian life. It's to be expected. Instead of being surprised by it, be ready for it. And actually trust God in the midst of it. That's a key response Peter urges us to have. As in so many areas of the Christian life, Peter urges us to learn from Jesus at the cross in our experiences of suffering. Look at chapter 2 and verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, Jesus did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So instead of getting angry or retaliating in the face of suffering or struggle, Peter urges us here, humble yourselves before God. Love your enemies as Jesus did. And ultimately, trust God to judge justly in the end. Now, the second main theme we can take away from this letter of 1 Peter is this. Peter urges us, always remember who you are in Christ. Peter's got a huge amount to say about the new identity Christians have in Christ throughout this letter because he's convinced that grasping hold of that new identity and remembering who we are in Christ is absolutely vital to our ability to live the Christian life in the face of suffering and struggle. Now, as a, as a family, we love a series of fantasy books written by Andrew Peterson called The Wing Feather Saga. Uh, we read them with my son a few years ago, and now we're reading them with my seven year old daughter. And in these books, we meet three children two brothers and a sister. And they belong to a poor family living in an enemy occupied land. And at first glance, they look just really ordinary, insignificant, even. However, in the course of the first book, and sorry, this is a plot spoiler, these three children discover that in fact, they are the rightful rulers of a beautiful country far across the sea. Now, they don't look any different when they discover that, but actually knowing their true identity changes everything. 
They go through frightening experiences, have to face terrifying enemies. But again and again, as they make their way through times of struggle and danger, they keep coming back to the same command. Remember who you are. Remember your royal identity, where you truly belong. And then live like it. Fight like it. Keep going because of it. They really are a great series of books. I'd really recommend them to anyone. You see, I believe Peter uses that same refrain right the way through this letter. Christians, always remember who you really are. Look at chapter 2 and verse 9. There Peter writes, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Now, we went through each of those descriptions in detail last term. But even just glancing at them now, I hope you can see this is a glorious new identity God has given his people in Christ. We are chosen. We are royal. We are holy. We are special and treasured by God. I can just remember to the world around us, Christians are often seen as unimportant, ignored, even just a bit ridiculous. But to the God of all grace, we are precious to him. We are loved by him. We are cared for by him. So what difference does remembering our true identity in Christ make to how we live the Christian life? Well, according to Peter, it makes all the difference. We have a new purpose in life, according to chapter 2, verse 9. So that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, when we remember who we really are in Christ, the Christian life becomes a life of worship and obedience to the God of grace. See, our calling now as the people of God is to worship God and obey him. Our primary identity is to be worshippers of the God of grace. And that transforms the way we see our lives, transforms the way we see our circumstances, transforms the way we see the people around us. The way we worship God, says Peter, is by declaring his praises to one another so that we each remember our new identity in Christ, but also to people who don't yet know Jesus so that they can put their trust in Jesus and share in that glorious new identity he gives to anyone who trusts in him. See, another key identity Peter reminds us of is in chapter 2 and verse 11, where he writes, you are foreigners and exiles in this world. Now that identity is much less glorious than the ones listed in verse 9. It speaks of a harsher reality that links in with what Peter says about suffering and struggle in the letter. He says, remember, you are foreigners and exiles. Don't be surprised when you feel out of step with the people around you. Don't be surprised when you feel like an outsider in this world. Like the wing feather children, you belong to another country now. You're on your way home but you're not there yet. So Peter urges us, don't try to blend in too much with the ways of this world. Instead, be holy, be different. Learn from Jesus a new way of living and a new way of loving the people around you. And all the time remember, you are a people on mission together. That's chapter 2 and verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans, says Peter, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, a key part of our calling to declare God's praises as God's people is so that people who don't yet believe in him will come to believe in him and glorify God through our witness together. Therefore, Peter urges us, let's help and encourage one another to live good lives among the pagans. Let's pray for each other in our friendships and relationships with the people who don't yet believe that we'll be effective witnesses for Jesus. And let's speak for Jesus and about Jesus whenever we have the opportunity. Remember chapter 3 and verse 15. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 
but do this with gentleness and respect. Peter urges us, always remember who you are as a church family. You are a people on mission together. And how can we help each other remember who we really are? That we're God's special possession, that we're foreigners and exiles in this world, that we're a people on mission together? Well, Peter tells us in chapter 4 and verses 7 to 11. He urges us there, be alert and of sober mind so you can pray for one another. Love one another deeply, he says, because you need one another. We will all suffer and struggle in this world. We need the love and support of each other. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Open up your lives to one another and use whatever gift you have received to serve others. See, our new identity in Christ is a corporate identity. So Peter urges us, help each other remember who you are by living together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, the final takeaway message from one, Peter, I want to talk about today is linked closely with each of the others. See, earlier when we were thinking about the reasons why Christians suffer in this world, we talked about the three classic enemies every Christian and every church will face. The world, the flesh, and the devil. But according to Peter, there's another greater reason and purpose behind our suffering and struggle as Christians. And it's this. God is refining us through suffering and struggle to make us more like Jesus. That's our final takeaway message from 1 Peter. Through times of suffering and struggle, we can rejoice that God is making us more like Jesus. It's a remarkable statement, isn't it? We looked at chapter 4, verse 12 earlier, where Peter says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you. But in the following verse, Peter says something remarkable, mind-blowing even. Chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice in those times of suffering and struggle, inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. See, Peter tells his readers here, not only should they not be surprised by times of suffering and struggle, they can also rejoice during those times as they trust that God is up to something good in their lives. Just look at chapter 4 and verse 17. Peter writes, For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, with the church, with God's people. See, Peter wants us to understand something here. The God of all grace uses times of suffering and struggle in his people's lives to refine us and make us more like Jesus. See, it's a truth that stands at the heart of the gospel. God loves us just as we are. And God loves us too much to leave us as we are. See, Peter urges us to rejoice in the fact that even through times of suffering and struggle, times we would never choose for ourselves, God is committed to making us more like Jesus, to restoring his image in us. You see, in God's hands, our times of suffering and struggle are never pointless. In fact, our times of suffering and struggle can be used by God, says Peter, to draw us closer to himself and give us a deeper understanding of the love of Jesus than we could ever experience without them. It's an amazing, transformative view of suffering and struggle. You see, for Peter, following Jesus in this world means following him on the way of the cross and the resurrection. We saw that in chapter 2 and verse 21. To this you were called, says Peter, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And what does it mean to follow Jesus on the way of the cross? Well, Peter has shown us throughout this letter. The way of the cross is the way of service, Use whatever gifts you have received to serve others, says Peter. The way of the cross is the way of submission. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. The way of the cross is the way of sacrifice. Denying yourself for the good of other people. The way of the cross supremely is the way 
of love. Above all, love each other deeply, says Peter. See, according to Peter in this letter, the life of a Christian and the life of a local church is a life spent following Jesus, learning from Jesus and being changed by Jesus on the way of the cross and the resurrection. It will involve suffering and struggle at times, but those times of suffering and struggle are never pointless. And the end result of those times will be joy when Jesus' glory is revealed in us. I was really helped by the way Tom Wright described the Christian life in an essay he wrote last year at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. There he wrote this. He says, Jesus' death and resurrection are our paradigm for life. In them we see God take the very worst thing that can possibly happen and transform it into something extraordinary and brilliant. It's an amazing picture of the Christian life, isn't it? According to 1 Peter, every Christian follows Jesus on the way of the cross and the resurrection. Our lives are ones of suffering now and glory later, of dying to ourselves and rising again to new life, of suffering for a little while before enjoying an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for us. Therefore, Peter tells us we can respond to times of suffering and struggle by rejoicing knowing that Jesus is with us in our times of suffering. Christ also suffered, remember Peter tells us. And also knowing that the God of grace is using those very experiences to make us more like Jesus. So what life-giving truths can we take away from this letter of 1 Peter? Well, I've just mentioned three of them today. The first, don't be surprised by suffering and struggle in the Christian life. Instead, be ready for it and humble yourselves before God in it. Always remember who you are in Christ, Peter tells us. You're God's special possession. You're foreigners and exiles in this world. You're a people on mission together. And thirdly, rejoice that God is committed to making you more like Jesus as you live out the cross and the resurrection in your life together, day by day. I hope we've seen over the last few months, Peter wrote this letter to encourage suffering, struggling Christians and to testify to the life-changing truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he finishes the letter by declaring to us all, this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Peter reminds us here, the Christian life can only be lived in daily dependence on God's grace. Day by day, God helps us and strengthens us. Jesus comes alongside us and teaches us. God forgives us and restores us when we get it wrong. And we don't deserve that grace. We can never earn that grace. All Peter urges us to do is to stand fast in that grace. Don't move away from it and help one another stand fast in God's grace as we live in community with each other and as we always remember who we really are in Christ. Peter's words in chapter 2. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Mm -hmm.